Plushy Palace by Nick Rock. Introduction. Hello, everyone. It's been a little bit since I finished the story, so I thought it would be as good a time as any to sit down and write an introduction for this thing. So I'm sitting here in my PJs enjoying a glass of Jameson, which was a Christmas gift from my awesome cousin, Mike Labo Samra, who at the time you're reading this should be knee-deep in the joys of fatherhood. Congratulations on that, by the way. While my beautiful girlfriend, Megan, sits across the room enjoying her Elder Scrolls online. That's just to give you a sort of taste of the life I lead. Point being, I'm nothing special, and I never try to pretend to be. I'm just a guy who works a dead-end job to have a little pocket cash and get through the day so I can come home and spend the evenings with my amazing better half and our four beautiful babies. Cats, in case anyone was wondering. Not actual babies. Actual babies are gross and sticky, and I don't care for them much at all. I'm trying to think of what there is to say about this book, and I'm drawing a bit of a blank. The fact that this is the story that wound up being the first that I managed to publish presents itself as a bit of an enigma to me. A little while back when I sat down and decided to really get serious about the whole writing thing, I wrote down all the ideas I had ever come up with in my life. Ideas that I had mapped out completely, outlined from beginning to end, and had a full picture of in my head. When I was finished with the list, I had roughly two dozen titles. I have in my life outlined in their entirety at least two dozen complete novels. Plushy Palace was not on that list anywhere. So where did it come from? Plushy Palace began as a short story, more of a writing exercise than anything else. See, I have a bit of a literary boner for alliteration. I don't know why, I can't explain it, I just always have. So I wrote down the title Pandemonium at the Plushy Palace, having no idea what exactly it meant. I just thought it sounded cool. So I wrote down the title and merely thought about it for a day or two. What could that mean? What is a plushy palace? What pandemonium could possibly happen at one? I just started a sort of stream of conscious narrative after that, not really knowing where I was going with it. The outcome of which is essentially the first chapter of this novella. Not much changed between then and now, a few grammatical corrections, maybe a few bits of foreshadowing, but more or less what you read in the book is how it appeared in the notebook that was its genesis. Once I was done with that, I reread it a few times, taking in what it was and what I had attempted to accomplish with it. It was then that I realized there was a lot more going on here than just the interrogation of a single puppet offender. There was an entire world here, of which I had just scratched the surface. There was something to this weird little experiment I had forced on myself, and I felt compelled to explore it deeper. There are obviously multiple inspirations for this piece that I would be a damn fool to try and deny. Any artist worth their salt in any business stands on the shoulders of giants. Anyone that says they're not is either lying to you or even worse to themselves. It took me quite a while to realize exactly how much of an influence the work of Dan Milano was on this story. For the longest time, I thought its closest relation was Meet the Feebles by director Peter Jackson, which is one of my all-time favorite films, by the way. In fact, in the early stages, whenever someone asked me about it, I would say it was Meet the Feebles meets Chinatown. Really, the world I've attempted to cobble together here owes more to Dan Milano than anything else. For those unfamiliar with his work, for shame, he is the mad genius behind Greg the Bunny. Greg the Bunny was a cable access show that eventually went to IFC, then to Fox, then back to IFC. He's also done a fair amount of voice work for the series Robot Chicken on Adult Swim. There are multiple elements of Greg the Bunny and his universe that are apparent throughout the story, and I didn't even realize were there until my third or fourth reading of the rough drafts. I use the word sock as a racial slur against puppets, the puppets themselves having ludicrously cartoonish names, and probably a half dozen other things that I myself am not aware of to this day. I like to think that Plushy Palace could possibly take place in the same universe as Greg the Bunny. While Decker and Zell are off solving mysteries, perhaps Greg and Warren the Ape are having artistic disagreements on the set of Sweet Knuckle Junction. 
I want to make it abundantly clear at no point was I ever attempting to piggyback or rip off any of the wonderful elements of the universe that Dan Milano created. Any unintentional reference throughout this work was exactly that, unintentional. Now that they're there, and I'm aware that they're there, however, it is with a sweet admiration and respect for that world that I have chosen to leave them in. Now perhaps if I had attempted to get this thing published with an established or professional publisher, they might have wanted me to remove these homages and little subconscious love notes. Which brings me to the next element of the foreword that I would like to address. Self-publishing. I know, I know. It totally sucks to self-publish and anyone that does it is not a, quote, real writer. But is that entirely true? I'd like to explain. Or perhaps a better word is defend, my choice of fully self-publishing this work. I know someone who went through a professional publisher for their first book, and that is amazing, and I give them nothing but kudos and praise for this. In reading the work, I didn't. it didn't feel like it was his. I've known this guy for the better part of two decades, and I could pick his writing out blindfolded if I were asked to. And the book that I read didn't really feel like something that would have come from him. It wasn't until later that I learned that the publisher had more or less forced certain elements on him uh, in the final stages. I'm not one to question anyone's integrity, and I would never call this into question, but that was something I simply wasn't willing to do. After all, what good is a writer at all if his vision is contorted and changed by the people that are bringing it to the masses? And what are they really offering that you can't get yourself through self-publishing aside from a bit of street cred and a built-in audience? To me, that wasn't worth the trade-off. I would rather sell a fraction of as many copies and stay true to the initial vision than be forced to crowbar in scenes or elements that, not, that did not feel organic, just to please some preconceived notion of what my story was supposed to be. I'm a firm believer that a writer is just as much an artist as any painter or sculptor. The only difference is that we use words instead of paints and clay. What would have happened if some art dealer looked at Van Gogh's Starry Night and said, it's nice, but wouldn't it work better as a picture of a sunrise? Don't get me wrong, I'm in no way comparing myself to this historical work of art, but the principle behind it is the same. All right, I'm going to wrap this up soon. Uh, going on and on about my justifications is probably getting a little tiresome, and I'm hoping you're anxious to get to the story itself. I'll finish this off with a few acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Mark Giamo, Andre Bellinger, Eddie Rock, Daniel Thompson for proofreading the final draft and giving me some much-needed feedback. I'd also like to make sure and thank Christy Katie for her beautiful and amazing cover art, which I was floored by when I first received it. I'd also like to thank my dad, though he hasn't read the book and I don't know how much he'd appreciate it if he did, it's not really his style, but he's always been unwavering in his support of my writing and I know he's always wanted to see me succeed at the thing I love doing most. So for that, I'm thankful. I decided to forego a dedication as any meaningful dedication I could make may come off as a potentially sarcastic or snarky. I considered dedicating it to myself, but that seemed like it might come off as a smarmy dick move, so in lieu of an official dedication, I'd like to present a more informal one. I want this story to be dedicated to you, to anyone holding this book right now and preparing to read it. This is truthfully and honestly for you, to anyone that is willing to give this nobody your attention for a while, you're what keep truly creative people going. Hopefully I entertain you with this weird little murder mystery with puppets. It's strange, it's kind of goofy, but also takes itself maybe a little too seriously at times. I hope you all enjoy the trip, and hopefully I can keep this new productive trend going <laughs> and put out more work for anyone who is interested in reading it. Thank you all for taking the time. Truly. Nick Rock, January 4th, 2017, 10.15 p.m. As I sit here recording this, it is October 30th, 2022, 11.15 a.m. And um, this is just a little extra introduction for the audiobook. Um, I do want to thank anybody for taking the time to listen, just as I did with anybody taking the time to read this book. 
Um, I've had a lot of time to reflect on it, and I'm actually still very proud of it. I think it's good, aside from finding misspellings and grammar errors in that introduction that I didn't realize were there, which is mortifying. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how often I'm going to release parts of this book, but I do plan on reading the entire book and doing a almost audio play with it. And uh, I'm going to have some people in to do voices of different characters, which I thank them in advance for doing that. Um, so yeah, that's really all I have to say right now. Um, that productive trend did not continue, in case you couldn't tell. Uh, this is the only book I've ever published so far. I have been working on a couple things. I don't know if they'll come to fruition. This was originally supposed to be part of a series of books, which will likely never happen at this point, or I will just do them out of spite because barely anybody read this thing. So, uh, anyways, I'm going to go ahead and stop now and we'll jump into the story. So thank you for giving me your time. Enjoy. Enjoy.